What's up, CA students in 678? My name is Jake. I'm one of the youth pastors here, and I just want to say welcome to CA students online. Whether you have been with us many times or this is your first time, I just want to say welcome, and I'm so glad you're here. We have a great night planned. I've just got a few short announcements. We'll play a game. Aiden is going to lead us in a time of worship. Levi is going to bring an amazing message. We'll wrap up with some worship. I'm excited for tonight. Let me start with a few announcements. First of all, tomorrow is Camp Day. I'm so excited for Camp Day. If you're coming in person uh, to CA for Camp Day, make sure, uh, though we'll have some chairs set up, we're asking you bring a chair as well. Bring your own water bottle and make sure you come in a camp-themed outfit of some kind. 678 starts at 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and high schools from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. Don't Forget, uh, if you're not able to join us in person, we are going to be posting the Camp Day Talks next week, and we'll also have uh, on our Instagram account, CA Students, at CA Students, we'll be following some of Camp Day as well, so be on the lookout for that. We're excited for Camp Day, pumped. Next, we have life groups uh, this coming week, both in person at high school and in person on Friday for 678, we also have Zoom life groups on Thursday from 3.30 to 4.30. We're excited for life groups. Everyone is welcome in a life group. Make sure you come on out for life groups. Next announcement is we um, are so excited to be registered for Hume this summer. It's our summer camp experience. And so we want to encourage you, registration is open, sign up for Hume this summer, whether you're in junior high or in high school. The dates are July 11th through 17th for high school and June 28th through July 3rd for 678. We're so excited. Make sure you sign up. Well, CA students online, I hope you're ready for a little game. We're going to play a game called Worse or Worser. <laughs> Worse or worser. It's kind of like, would you rather, but it's worse or worser. Which one is worse? Go ahead and put it in the chat um, or just decide whenever you watch this to yourself. I like some of these. Are you ready for the first one? Here we go. Worse or worser. Eating a banana with ketchup or eating a cucumber with Nutella? I would say... <laughs> Eating a banana with ketchup is worse, sir. That's my personal opinion. What do you think? Put it in the chat. That's number one. Let's go to number two. Let's go to number two. Taking a test or writing a paper? Taking a test or writing a paper? What do you think is worse, sir? Kind of depends for me what the test is on and what the paper's on, but maybe you know right away what's worse or taking a test or writing a paper. Are you ready for number three? Put it in the chat if you're able. Eating raw fish or drinking spoiled milk? Eating raw fish or drinking spoiled milk? Not like good, legit sushi. Like I'm thinking like you just caught a fish. Probably shouldn't do that. Unless you cook it. <laughs> but eating raw fish or drinking spoiled milk, which one is worser in your opinion? I just love sushi so much, you know? I, I don't know. All right. Number four. <laughs> number four. Which one's worser? Sitting on an unknown liquid. The worst. Or sitting on gum. Also terrible. Sitting on an unknown liquid. <laughs> We've all been there. Or sitting on gum. Which one is worse? Worse or worser? <laughs> They're both terrible. I can't even make up my mind. Maybe you can make up your mind. I think I'd rather <laughs> sit on gum than sit on an unknown liquid. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather have three inch long fingernails or have no fingernails? <laughs> Would you rather have three inch long fingernails or have no fingernails? Which one is worse, sir? Which one's worse? <laughs> uh, I think I would go not having fingernails just because I don't want to, like, I don't know. I just personally feel like, you know, three-inch-long fingernails would just get in the way a lot for me. 
Let's go to the next one. Which is worse, a fly or a mosquito? Ooh, a fly or a mosquito? Yikes. I don't like either of them to be in my presence. Worse, I would say a fly. Worser, I would say a mosquito. I don't want that thing sucking my blood. All right, next one. Would you rather have an elephant sitting on your foot or a car drive over your foot? Both <laughs> not good. An elephant sitting on your foot or a car driving over your foot? I love animals, so the elephant on my foot has an animal involved. So I think I would prefer that one. But I don't know what you would think. Put it in the chat. Next one. Would you rather not take a shower for a week or not brush your teeth for a week? Woo! Which one's worse, sir? Not take a shower for a week or not brush your teeth for a week? Oh, man. I think I would rather not shower for a week. That's worse. But worser would be not brushing your teeth for a week. Yikes. Um, worse or worser, throwing up or diarrhea? I'm sorry that you had to think of throw up and diarrhea on CA Students Online. But which one's worse and which one's worser? I think diarrhea is pretty worse, but throwing up's worser to me. I don't know. What do you think? Put it in the chat. I hope you guys had a good time playing worse or worser. There are some yucky things here. I definitely, I think one of the worst ones is sitting on an unknown liquid. Hopefully that hasn't happened to you in a while, and hopefully it never happens to you in your life. I'm going to transition. We're going to head into a time of worship. We love playing silly games, but ultimately we love to worship God as CA students um, and CA students online. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go into a time of worship. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day, this night. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the joy that there is in following you. Thank you for every single person listening to my voice. I pray that they would encounter you in worship and in the teaching and that they would know how much you love them. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. A Men, let's worship CA students in 678. Hey CA students 678, so glad you're joining us for another CA students online. We're going to jump into a time of worship, but before we do, I just wanted to explain uh, the heart that I had for this time of worship. It's going to look a little different. Um, instead of it being more corporate, we're continually encouraging us to sing songs. Um, there's a couple points where I just played uh, a little bit on the piano and kind of just did some songs that came to the top of my head. Um, and my heart for this time was just that we would all, uh, myself while I was playing, but also each and every one of you behind the screen there, would experience the atmosphere uh, of worship, of being close to the Lord as we, as we sing, as we play. Um, and so what I wanted was to encourage you guys to connect with the Lord uh, in an individual, personal way in this time of worship. And that could look like so many different things. It could look like pulling out your Bible as we sing, pulling out um, a piece of paper to journal or to draw, or to, if you're a musician, you could play along or something like that. Um, because I wanted this time to be an individual connection point for each and every one of us as we worship, because I find that so powerful and so impactful and I just wanted to provide this opportunity and this space. As always the lyrics will be in the description down below um, if you do want to but also feel free to just to look away from the video or turn the video screen away from you because it's really not about that it's more about just engaging in worship in this time and that can look in so many different ways so I just wanted to encourage you guys on that before we jump in but let's worship together. We've waited. 
Oh, we waited for this day. We gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Your glory, like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. Come on, you're the reason. And you're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. And open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we look into the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, and Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason, you're the reason we're here, and you're the reason we're singing. Come on, say, open up the heaven. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Yeah. Mm. sing say and show us show us your glory show us lord and show us your power and show us show us your glory lord one more time and show us show us your glory and show us, show us your power, and show us, and show us your glory, Lord. In Jesus Christ, you are my one desire, my one desire, you are my one desire. In Jesus Christ, you are my one desire, my one desire, you are my one desire, know you more, I want to love you more, we sing, I want to hunger more, and for you, I want to know.
and for you in Jesus Christ you are my one desire one desire you are my one desire and Savior friend you are my one desire my one Desire, you are my one desire. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, we silence fear. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. And Jesus, Jesus, sing it again. And Jesus, Jesus Oh Jesus, Jesus you do Lord You silence me Oh and Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble And Jesus, Jesus Come on your name And your name the shadows can deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive and forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome And your name is alive and forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome And Jesus Jesus, you do. You make the darkness tremble. And Jesus, Jesus, you silence all my fear. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, silence. Oh.
CA Student 678, so good to be with you guys. My name is Levi. I'm one of the pastors on the team here, and I'm so glad to be with you. If you're here on Friday night, so stoked you're here. Drop a hi in the chat. Uh, if you're watching this some other time, I'm so glad you decided to jump in tonight. Hey, at, at 678 and CA Students, we're people that are trying to continue to grow in our complete commitment to Jesus. But the only way we can do that is if we have a way of knowing who Jesus is and the way that he wants us to live. Can you imagine trying to follow Jesus without that? It's like just trying to reason it all together. Like, I think Jesus is like this. And someone else is like, well, I think Jesus is actually like this. You know, and then no one can agree. And then it's hard to follow Jesus, right? Well, the only way following Jesus works is because we have the Bible. We have the Bible. And we believe that the Bible is not just reasoning but it's revelation. The Bible is not just people trying to piece together what God must be like and how he wants us to live. It's actually God himself showing us who he is, what he's like, and what the kind of life that he's invited us and commanded us to live. And so why does it matter what the Bible says? It matters because what the Bible says is what God says. And so there's this one time, Kayla, my wife, and I, we were, we always have date night on Thursday night. Love date night. Love going somewhere fun to eat. And there's this one date night where we had talked earlier, like, be thinking about where you want to go for date night. And I'm like, ooh, -hoo, okay. And so I was thinking, like, man, where do I want to go for date night tonight? And then it came to me. Taco Bell. Taco Bell is where I want to go for date night. Probably not a good idea, right? But I, I just, I, I thought I remember, I knew Kayla wasn't a big fan of Taco Bell, but I, but I really thought I remembered her saying that she would like to try it sometime. I, I really remembered her saying that. And so I came home from work, uh, so excited to date my wife. And I'm like, hey, Kayla, you want to go to Taco Bell for date night? And she's like, no, not even a little bit. I, I, she does not like Taco Bell, right? And I was like, Oh, but you said that you, you wanted to try it sometime. And she was like, no, I, I, never, I never said that, <laughs> right? And, and what happened is when she said that, I got really disappointed because I had kind of worked up an appetite for a chalupa or seven at that point. And, and not only was I disappointed, but it even caused me to kind of like doubt Kayla, like, hmm, why did you like say that and then not do it, you know? But the reality is, it's not that Kayla did something wrong. It's that I remembered wrong. I was wrong. Kayla, if you're watching this, you were right. I was wrong. <laughs> right? And see, student 678, if you're ever married, practice saying that. It's going to make your marriage better. Right? <laughs> you were right. I was wrong. Right? And so because I had an incorrect understanding of what Kayla said, it led me to incorrect expectations of what life with her would be like. Right? And so Tonight, we're going to talk about 10 things the Bible doesn't say. 10 things the Bible doesn't say. And why does it matter what the Bible doesn't say? Because if you believe some, God said something that he never said, then when he doesn't do that, you're going to be disappointed in God for not doing something he never said he would. <laughs> And if you believe the wrong things, there's going to be a gap between your expectations of life with God and your experience of life with God. And that gap between your expectations and your experience is going to lead to disappointment at least and probably also discouragement, disillusionment, even despair in God. And it will lead you to believe that God isn't who he, said, who he actually is. It's going to lead you to believe all kinds of crazy things like God doesn't care about you. Having wrong belief is difficult because our actions are shaped by our beliefs. And so if you have wrong beliefs, you're going to have wrong actions. And living with the wrong beliefs will cause you to be disappointed with God uh, and cause you to misrepresent him in your words and actions to others. And so it really matters to know what God has said in the Bible. And it's important to know what God hasn't said in the Bible if we're going to be able to live our lives completely for him. And so let's pray and then let's see what God actually has to say in his words. So Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that you didn't just leave us to try to, for reasoning alone, to try to figure out who you are, but you 
You gave us revelation. You showed us the kind of God that you are and the kind of lives we get to live with you. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to show your abundant life to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, 10 things the Bible doesn't say. Here's the first one. Number one, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Have you heard that before? Not from the Bible. It's not in there, right? And here's the problem with everything happens for a reason. This phrase is an escape from evil, not a solution for evil, right? This phrase is what happens when we try to rationalize our pain, when we experience something hard or bad. We try to say, well, everything happens for a reason. But that's not what the Bible says. What is, God is not primarily interested in rationalizing our pain. He's interested in redeeming our pain, in taking something bad and turning it into something good. This is what the Bible actually says in Romans 8.28. It says that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so God didn't necessarily cause that bad thing to happen, but he will certainly use it and work it for good. Everything happens for a reason, renames evil instead of conquering it. It's a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty, and God wants to do even better than that. He wants to do better than we can imagine. He wants to take the bad things that happen in our lives and transform them into things that are good. And so that's the first one. Number two, The Bible never says, time heals all wounds. (laughs) Time heals all wounds. And if you actually pause and think about it for a second, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? I think what a lot of people are talking about or thinking about is the idea of homeostasis, that your body, when it's injured, over time will repair itself, right? But time isn't repairing your body. Your cells in your body (laughs) is repairing your body. Uh, It's because healing agents are working across time, not time itself being the healer. Time has no causal power, right? It's just a dimension across which things with causal power act, (laughs) right? Here's the thing. Time cannot heal you. And, And the reason I care about you guys knowing that this isn't in the Bible is because I don't want you to live your lives just trying to tough it out and suffer needlessly. Come to Jesus. He is the healer. Only Jesus can heal all wounds. And I'm not just talking physical, though I am talking about, I'm talking about emotional wounds, relational wounds, spiritual wounds. Jesus is the healer, and he's the only one that can bring the healing that we need. And so don't just try to tough it out and suffer needlessly in your life. Come to the healer. Come to Jesus. And ultimately, we are offered the hope of resurrection that one day every wound will be healed and we will live fullness of life with Jesus for eternity. That's awesome. That's the second thing. The third thing, number three, the Bible doesn't say everyone is inherently good. Everyone is inherently good. You might hear like, well, everyone's just basically good, right? This is not found in the Bible. And when when people say this, a lot of times what they're thinking is that if you just do what comes naturally to you, then you'll be doing what's good because you're naturally good, right? Here's, Here's the problem. What the Bible actually says is that we were created good, but then in Genesis 3, humankind sinned and and it was human nature was broken. (laughs) And so because of that, Actually, everyone is not inherently good. Everyone is inherently in need of saving from sin. Everyone is in need of salvation. Humankind, we are not blank slates. We start in sin. And this is important because if we don't believe this, we start to think that something other than sin is the real problem. And if something other than sin is the real problem, then something other than Jesus is the real solution. But see, students in 6, 7, 8, All other problems in our world have their beginning in sin in the human heart. And Jesus is the only solution for sin in the human heart, which makes Jesus the only solution for our world. People are not inherently good. We are inherently in need of a Savior, and Jesus is just the Savior that we need. Number four, the Bible does not say, follow your heart. Live your truth. To thine own self be true, right? This kind of collection of ideas, right? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? 
if the heart is deceitful above all things, that's not what you should be following, right? And so if you say like something that is true for you, but not true for other people, that's the definition of an opinion, not truth. And, and I want to I be really clear. My goal is not to mock people that say things like this or think this way. My goal is to teach what the scriptures say. And the script, what the scriptures have to say is what God has to say. And what scripture teaches is that we were made good. We were made good and not just kind of good. We were made in the image of God kind of good. That's incredible. But we were broken by sin, like we said in point three. And if we, because we were broken in sin, what that means is that our human nature was broken. So what comes naturally to me are broken desires. And if what comes naturally to, to me are broken desires, what that means is that I can't trust myself. I can't trust my heart. I can't trust my truth. I require a savior that hasn't been broken by sin. And Jesus is that savior. And what really blows my mind is that not only does he reveal what is truly good, but he provides a way to be transformed so that I can become what is truly good. That's mind-blowing. That's the gospel of Jesus, right? And so that's the fourth thing. Here's the fifth thing the Bible doesn't say God works in mysterious ways. Ooh, that sounds so scriptural, but it's not. The Bible, the Bible doesn't say it. Here's what the Bible does say. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it, summarizing it, says that his ways are not our ways, and our thoughts, his thoughts, are not our thoughts. In other words, God is categorically above us. We are finite beings. He is infinite or infinite, right? We cannot fully comprehend the ways of God. So in that way, Sure, the way God works to us can sometimes seem mysterious, but I want to counterbalance that with something the Bible also says. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that we have been given the mind of Christ. And what that means is we can understand some of his plans. Some things that used to be mysteries have been made known to us, like how salvation wasn't just for Israel, but it's also for the Gentiles like me, right? God has brought us into some of his his plans. That's the whole point of revelation, right? We've been given the mind of Christ. And so, yes, God is infinite and we are still finite, but also God has let us in on so many of his plans and so many of his desires and his will for the world. And I think that we often want to understand things because we want to control things. And when we understand it, we feel like we're in control. But the hope of the gospel is not that you can control everything. The hope of the gospel is that God always has been in control of everything and always will be in control of everything. And he's holding you safely and securely. And so he, here's what I want to invite you to. Don't just aim for understanding 6, 7, 8, and CA students. Aim for the hope that's in the gospel, that God has everything in his control and he's holding you safely. Halfway through, here comes number six. Number six, the Bible does not say all sins are equal. It does not say all sins are equal. He, here's what the Bible does say in Romans chapter six, verse 23. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's true that all sin accomplishes separation from God, which results in spiritual death, but that doesn't mean that all sins are equal. Excuse me. In the, in the book of Leviticus, the Levitical code called for different ways to account for different kinds of sin with different levels of punishment uh, ascribed to them. And in the New Testament, sexual sin is uh, especially accounted as bad. And so there are uh, not all sin is equal, but all sin does accomplish separation from God, which results in spiritual death. And that's the good news of the gospel, is that despite that, God made a way for every kind of sin to be forgiven, right? So jumping from number six to number seven, God helps those who, helps, who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. Nope. That's the opposite of the gospel. <laughs> that is the opposite of the gospel. John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus himself says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. 
right? There's, there's a, what theologians call prevenient grace. Ooh, nice one. Where we were trapped in our sin, go to Romans 6 for that, and utterly unable to come to God at all. But God, in his prevenient grace, while we were still sinners and enemies of God, God died for us. And he made a way for us to respond to him. And it's true that if you refuse God, God won't force himself upon you. God won't force himself on you. But accepting his free gift and receiving his empowering help is very different than trying to earn his help. While we were still enemies of God, that's when God helped us, right? Before we tried to help ourselves, God helps us, right? And so that's number seven. Here comes number eight. God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Here's what's actually we see in scripture. God won't give you more than God can handle, but he will give you more than you can handle, <laughs> right? And why is this important? It's because I don't want you to assume that you can handle life. <laughs> I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but you can't handle life. I can't handle life. And I don't want you to assume that you're going to be able to handle whatever comes your way because you won't be able to. And when you're not able to, you're going to feel overwhelmed. But if you think you should be able to handle it, there's going to be shame on top of feeling overwhelmed. And God, that's not what God has for you. Instead, I want you to be able to receive the sustaining grace of God in every season of your life. God is enough for whatever comes your way. You're not, but he is, and he is completely accessible to you should you choose to receive his gift of grace. And so God will give you more than handle, but there's no such thing as something God can't handle. That's number eight. Here comes number nine. This is a big one. I hear this a lot right now, is God doesn't judge people. God doesn't judge people. This is quite simply not what the Bible teaches. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Another example is Isaiah 33, 22. It says, For the Lord is our judge. There it is. <laughs> the Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. But guess what he says because of that? It is he who will save us, right? And j just so you know, I'm not cherry picking two random verses in the Bible. You can go James 4, 12, Revelations 20, 12, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Acts 17, 31, Psalm 50, verse 6, Romans 14, 10 through 12, and 2 Timothy 4 through 8. It's all over the Bible that God is the judge, that God will judge us. And and be because that's true, that's what makes salvation found in Jesus so mind-blowing. Because salvation is not just to save you from the penalty of sin, it's to save you from the condition of sin that earned that penalty. It's like if you were on fire, right, and you were s setting things on fire because you were on fire, and then you had to go to jail because you were setting things on fire, right? <laughs> there, there's the penalty for what you've done wrong because you've set things on fire, and God wants to save you from that penalty. But even more than that, he wants it so you're not on fire anymore, right? He wants to save you from the condition that causes you to act out in sin. God wants to save you so completely. He doesn't just want to alter your behavior. He wants to transform your heart. And so if God calls you to live in a certain way, it's not just to restrict you, it's to save you, right? And it's all tied to the idea that what I want to do is not really that bad. It's just against God's arbitrary rules, right? But all that changes if you consider God to be the standard of goodness rather than God matching up with whatever goodness is, right? And, and here's why I think this idea of God judging people is hard for us to hear. It's hard for us to understand. It's because our culture declares that it's impossible to love someone and to judge them. That our culture would say it's impossible to love and disagree with a person's choices, values, and to say that those choices and values are wrong. Our culture would say you can't say that and love them, right? And so because of that, when I say God judges people, what a lot of you will hear 
is God hates or rejects or despises people. But that couldn't be further from the truth, CA students in 6, 7, 8. This is the scandal of grace, that the one person who could condemn the whole world is the one who actually instead loved it and chose to save it instead. The God of all creation looked at the world in judgment and judged it as sinful. But instead of bringing a guillotine, he brought grace. You see, the only way that God is not fair is that he's not fair in your favor. We call it grace. He gives you what you don't deserve. God gave Jesus the death we deserve so that we can have the life Jesus deserved. God made a way for us to be saved by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So CA student 678, I want to be really clear. Judgment is coming. But we don't need to be terrified of that because if you are in Christ, if you've said yes to Jesus and, be, and you've repented from your sins and received his grace, then when judgment day comes, you're not standing there just because you've been so <laughs> impressive, but Jesus' own righteousness will cover you. And that's what God will see on judgment day. You'll be saved by the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And so, yes, God judges us, but he also has provided a way to cover us in righteousness for when he judges us. And so that's the only way that God is still good, that he's still just, and he is completely loving in everything that he does. Here's the 10th one. <laughs> the 10th thing the Bible doesn't say is that everyone is a child of God. And you hear that and you went, <gasps> oh no, I really thought the Bible said that one, right? Well, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible clearly teaches that we are created by God, but actually, while we are still in our sin, the Bible says that we're actually, we start off as enemies of God. But the story doesn't end there. Because of this salvation that God offers so freely through Jesus, we can become children of God. This is what Romans 8, 14 through 16 says. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, get this, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Everyone starts off as a creation of God and even as an enemy of God, but God has made a way for every single person who would say yes to become a child of God. And that's a life only available through Jesus. And so 678 CA students, I hope you feel encouraged and you feel instructed that that some of these things that we hear, and sometimes we even start thinking that the Bible actually says, the, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says something way better. <laughs> the Bible, th the whole thing Jesus came to bring is the gospel. It's the good news. It's the good news. Jesus has something better for you. And so I want you to uh, spend the rest of your night, or whenever you're watching this, I want you to be remembering that God has something better for you, and it's only life with him in which that is accessed, in which that is unlocked. And so, hey, let's together, see you students 678, let's be students of the Bible, because when we study what scripture has to say, we study what God has to say. And we, when we know what he has said, then our expectations of God will line up with our experience of God, and our faith will be built, and we'll be able to invite more and more people into the abundant life that he's provided for us. And so let's pray and thank God for who he is and the kind of life he's made available for us. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we can know you for sure through it. Thank you for revealing yourself to it. So God, I thank you for what your Bible does say, that your Bible, that your word has, has better news than we could come up with on our own. I pray that you would help every single one of us to respond to your word, that we would turn from our sin, that we would repent and come towards you, Lord Jesus, as we are saved and empowered by your grace. Jesus, I pray that we would experience and invite other people into the abundant life that you bring us to. We pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, CA students in 678.